Okay, hi folks, uh, Paul here. I want to start this video fishing journal off um, by sharing a fun video clip one of our uh, TNF viewers, Union SE, sent along. It's just plain fun and instructive too. What isn't, huh? <laughs> in terms of the possibility of getting in over your head with tackle that's too light for the jungle. In Journal 23, I caught a bass that already had a hook in its gullet, uh, obviously having broken somebody off previously. That bass was then left having to drag around a good 30 feet of fishing line. So kudos to Union SE for meeting the call of duty and going above and beyond <laughs> in accomplishing it. Uh, I I'm thinking maybe we should have a, a TNF Distinguished Service Medal or something for such heroism. Here's a video, check it out, um, and all I can say is that's true jungle warfare right there. Okay, on to Video Fishing Journal 24, number 24 now. This one's a cool one in my book. Um, in addition to this summer's jungle warfare series, um, actually the final one as fall is coming on fast. Um, the vegetation's dying back rapidly, happens really quickly uh, here in the month of August, um, and I think it's light level drops. Um, and, and water levels are receding too, uh, quite rapidly. But I managed to slip this one in before fall uh, really hit. This one was an opportunity to take advantage of feeding bass using an actual accurate match the hatch type presentation. Uh, something that's rarely easy to do, especially outside of the fly fishing world. It came out of an unfortunate event, actually, that happened while I was filming a punching segment for our Jungle Warfare series, in which I managed to hook a bass too deep, killing it. Am I getting bit? That's, that's a fish, all right. <laughs> oh, I hope we didn't take it too deep. And you can see we are esophagus hooked. And that is a dead bass. However, this unfortunate event gave us the opportunity to check the contents of that bass's stomach. And those contents were revealing, possibly explaining the nature of the bites I was receiving while punching and tipping me off to the possibility of a true match the hatch type scenario. So here are the stomach contents. Eight crayfish, relatively recently captured. <laughs> this tells us that sunfishes aren't the only game in town, even the primary game for some bass on our jungle warfare pond. So was this bass a unique crayfish specialist? Uh, possibly, but the number of crayfish in that stomach suggests that there are simply a lot of crays out there to be caught. And almost certainly this bass was not the only one that found and, and is taking advantage of this. So to find out, all I had to do to match that hatch, so to speak, was to narrow down possible locations and then come up with an appropriate lure that would match what the bass would be expecting to see. The bass should do the rest. When we're on feeding bass, especially those with a specific uh, search image in their sights, we might not actually need any special triggering actions to incite a bite, to incite bites. The lure itself may take care of that on its own. If we have the context correct, that is, bass are truly targeting crayfish, the lure and presentation offer a good enough mimic, and I don't spook them, <laughs> uh, we should be in business. I maintain that context speaks loudest, most influentially, in terms of duping fish with artificial lures. Context is the factors that tell bass when, where, and how they are most apt to get fed. To take advantage of this, in the case of crayfish, it helps to know something about crayfish ourselves. And then we need to go a step deeper and know what the bass know about crayfish in the particular water body that we're going to hit. Okay, here's something about crayfish. Many, if not most, water bodies have large crayfish populations. 
If it's wet for any uh, duration of time, that water body probably has crayfish. Crayfish generally need firm substrate in which to dig their retreats, their hides. Crayfish seasonally live uh, deep in the winter, usually in pond or lake basins or in, in deep pool basins and streams. And most move into shallow sunlit waters for the warm months. And it's there that they, they also raise their young. Uh, crayfishes do not live very long, uh, most reaching maturity in their second year, uh, and most rarely live past age three. Crayfish, like sunfishes, are not entirely easy for bass to capture. While crayfish are safe in their retreats, they must come out to collect food. This is when they are most vulnerable to bass. Lastly, crayfish are low light active, especially at night. If you're wondering whether your waters contain crayfish, try crayfish spotting. That's going out with a flashlight some summer night um, and just, just spot those shallows. The abundance of crayfish may, may surprise you, even shock you. <laughs> okay, taking it a step deeper, here's something about crayfish. In our jungle warfare pond, things I could figure out. Two locations stand out. From Journal 23, remember that the humps and bars left over from the, the gravel mining operations were left bare from wave action and water level drops, exposing that good substrate, that good hard substrate for the crayfish to dig their retreats in. Our crayfish packed bass came from just such a rubble topped hump. Uh, Crayfish may have factored into the reason the majority of my pitching bites actually came on those humps and came on the bottom, uh, those bass picking my baits up from the bottom. The next likely location was along the shorelines where wave action and water level drops have left behind clean, firm substrate. Pretty much the same thing as the humps. Wave action, anything exposed to the surface where wave action can clear away sediment, um, or water level drops expose them and bleach them in the sun is where the native substrate gets exposed and that's in these gravel quarries is sand, gravel, and rock. One such shoreline happened to be the one that I launched my boat to shoot the Jungle Warfare series from. That shoreline is west facing, mean it takes the brunt of the prevailing westerly winds that we get here. Uh, the resulting waves um, exposing the sand, gravel, and rubble substrate on, on that shoreline in particular. I had actually spotted some of those crayfish hunting bass along that shoreline. Um, I even made a few casts to them, but expecting bluegill hunters, I had a, a bluegill-esque swim jig tied on, and they showed little interest in chasing it. These dark clouds have rolled in, and I can hear bass busting all over, and there's, there's three of them right in front of me. They're cruising, they're moving now. And they're not in, they're there. Yeah, they're interested in the jig. If I, uh, the jig has to move fast. Yeah, they were willing to poke at it when it when it moved. <laughs> nice to know there are bass around me. All right, let's decide what we're gonna do here.
After discovering the stomach contents, though, I decided to go back after those cruisers along that shoreline again and see if I could give them something closer to their expectations, uh, possibly offering us the opportunity to see a true match-the-hatch scenario in, in bass fishing, in conventional bass fishing. Back at home, I rigged up a good craw mimic, uh, starting with a snag-resistant jig head of appropriate weight for that water depth that, that I'd be fishing um, and the line diameter I'd be using. I chose an appropriately small soft plastic crawfish bait um, and, and modified the jig head a bit to lend itself better to that, that smaller crayfish and then returned to hit that shoreline. Um, in a bit, I'll share the lure and modifications that I, that I chose to, to uh, use and make. I shot for low light periods. Uh, early morning and uh, under an overcast sky uh, when the crayfish would be most apt to be active and my job of presentation uh, would be made a bit easier in that shallow flat calm water. So here's the pre presentation challenge. Under low lighting I most probably can't expect to sight fish, that is spot fish before I cast. Being in such shallow water it'll be easy to alarm them by their seeing me or by my dropping the lure or even the line on top of them. To add to the challenge, that relatively clean shoreline break, I'm targeting for this, that the inside weed line is narrow, especially as the water is dropping, uh, and, and strewn with obstacles. Fouling something, uh, that snagging something, runs the risk of kicking that lure into the not food category for those fish. Um, or, or uh, alarming them outright. The right weight and design of the jig head, um, casting accuracy, and some luck are the dice rolls in this in this adventure. Okay, that should clue us in. Let's do it. Let's get out there and see if we can catch some of those crayfish hunters. To get a realistic crayfish lure for this scenario, shallow, clear, cover-strewn water, the jig head is the start. It's foundational. The head needs to be of appropriate weight for the depth and speed that I plan to fish it. A crayfish is essentially married to the substrate, so the weight of the jig head should be enough to keep that jig glued to the bottom, but not so heavy that it hangs up on every nook and cranny in that substrate. The head also needs to be of a snag-resistant design in this mixed cover strewn water. The head I used uh, was a Kalen's Spot Stalker jig head. Great design, conical head, it's a, it's a stand-up style, uh, but with the weight of a plastic in the back, sometimes they can, uh, any stand-up head can topple over. A buoyant plastic really helps, but I help it along even more by bending that hook up. Uh, just get a bend in it that allows that bait to stand up a little bit more and uh, be more stable in the standing position. I also modify the weed guard just a little bit. Um, that pointy end, I don't want poking a fish and potentially having it spit the lure, but also after it's hooked, I'm a little concerned that that pointed wire can stick a fish in the eye if it is, is sticking outside of the mouth. Next is the soft plastic bait that I chose to use. A lot of options there, and I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not sponsored by anybody here. But um, the new TRD Craw Z from Z-Man is a nice looking bait. And being elastic plastic, it is very, very buoyant. Uh, and it looked great in the water. Uh, again, there are a lot of options out there. And you can trust me on this. I've been uh, a long time fly fisherman, fly designer. And I came up with a, a, a bunch of different crayfish patterns that worked very, very well. If you've got the context right, that is, you know what the fish are actually looking for. It's surprising what you can actually get away with. A really accurate representation may often be just gravy. That said, the closer to the real thing, the better. 
Just realize how our lure looks in hand is only one, and an often biased, parameter your fish will judge your presentation on. So this jig head and little craw were the ones that I chose to go with. Just happens to be the one I chose, and uh, you'll see it, and you may want to know what I chose to use. Okay, let's take it out, throw it in the water, hopefully in front of some crayfish munching bass. I'm expecting if there's bass there, they're gonna know just what this is and go for it. All right, we've lost a lot of shoreline here. Such shallow flat water, I wanna be darn careful when I move my line on the surface. There's somebody munching on it and it is a bass. Yes. Oh, come out of that stuff. <laughs> Crayfish hunter. Oh, come on, hold, hold, baby. Oh, yes. All right. Hello there, sweet pea. I wonder if you're the bass that I was watching the other day. Hard to know. There it is. <clears throat> Crayfish hunter. Very nice, very nice. Little tiny hook. <sighs> okay, hon. Any antennae sticking out of there? Nope. Crayfish are small here, so there's... All right, there you go, sweetie. Whoop. <laughs> Got a little tangled in that. That uh, smart weed. All right, yeehaw, conversion. Well, we'll see if this will climb over wood. There's a fish, that's <laughs> bluegill. I think they're bluegills um, grabbing the claws of my Craw. All right, there's another one on it. Okay, we know what the soup of the day is today in this pond this year, probably every year. Right over the wood, good, good. All right. Let that line lay, watch it. Okay, it's starting to sink already. Um, I'm using line because it's the most sensitive thing and I'm doing what's called stitching. Bill Murphy's term. And it's just pulling the Craw along the bottom or any bait. Here's the thing very realistic crayfish, once they know it's not food, it's not food. <laughs> and even the bluegills will stop biting it. Oh, this shoreline vegetation makes this really tough. I took a bass here. This is where I took that one on the spoon. And I'm thinking that uh, 
it's a nice little opening for bass to penetrate the shallows. Get that line off the water, Paul. It's so calm, even though it's cloudy. Okay, I gotta swim through. There we go. Falls. Watching my line. There's one. Something. <sighs> All right. Crayfish eating bass. Oh, get off of that. Oh. Oh, there we go. <laughs> He's been caught before this year. Let's see if I can do a better job of unhooking. Let's get this camera down. Small bar, little hook. He's got a really torn maxillary and pre-max. So he was ripped. Poor guy. I try not to do that with my fish. Okay. Dark slopwater bass hunting the inside weed edge for crayfish. There you go, sweet pea. Yeehaw. Okay. What do you think, folks? Pretty cool? Here's another <laughs> heavy cover slop situation that you wouldn't expect exactly. 